Well, John, you're a long-time member of the Cruising Yacht Club and a former Commodore, which we'll come to later. How did you first become involved here with the CYC? Uh, I'd been sailing for many years, for not many years, I sailed a lot, and, uh, and then I was living in the eastern suburbs, but I wasn't a member of the CYC, hadn't sailed out of here, moved over to the North Shore, started sailing out of the Middle Harbour Yacht Club, came back to the eastern suburbs, and of course an old drinking pal would be Tony Cable, who you'd know. We used to spend a bit of time at the old Golden Sheaf in Double Bay, and he said, well, it's time you got into the CYC, and that happened in the 1970-71 season, uh, when I started sailing with John Wyle on the old corroboree, the old 40-foot s, &S. Uh, I sailed with him for two years. I think I joined actually in 71. Uh, but sailed from then on with the CYC. It's yeah. never left the place, or it never left me, I think. And what were your early <coughs> memories here of some of the characters and the people involved? Well, it was full of them. I mean, it was like a rugby club in those days, in the 60s and 70s. It was uh, just full of old ocean wallopers uh, and all the old characters that, that used to hang out with the CYC in those days. It was full of them. I mean, you know, there was virtually no one here who couldn't be <laughs> considered a character almost. Um, and uh, a lot of top sailors. I mean, in those days, even Sid Fisher used to hang out here, which is, you know, doesn't happen anymore. Uh, and a lot of the top sailors, it was more, uh, uh, when you finished the race in those days, everyone came back to the CYC and, and had a few drinks and sometimes a lot of drinks. A few more drinks, yeah. yeah. But uh, that doesn't seem to happen so much anymore. It does, I think, on the Saturday short races. but. Yeah. Uh, you could remember we used to do a 90 mile or something and arrive back at about six in the morning on Saturday or Sunday or whatever it was and uh, and uh, we're going to be here all day. 24 hours later it'd still be going. They'd still be going, yeah, yeah. and it'd be the whole fleet. It wouldn't be, wouldn't, well, the rich owners would be here too, well, some of the rich owners would be here. Sir Robert wouldn't be here, but uh, a few others would be. Yes. So, but where did you learn to sail? Did you? Uh, I went to sea when I was very young on, a, on an uncle's fishing boat out of lawn, a cooter boat out of the lawn jetty, uh, but that was just during the school holidays. Didn't sail. Uh, didn't sail until I got to, I was living in Canada, I was in the military over there and I was used to sail on my CO's Grand on Lake Ontario. Uh, previous to that I trained on a racing, on a training dinghy uh, with the sailing club there and then graduated to Dragons and then came back to Australia didn't sail for some years until I came back from a posting in England and uh, got into a Gwen 12. Sailed that for a year or two. Then as I said I was over in Middle Harbour, sailing out of Middle Harbour for a year or two and then came back here and suddenly discovered ocean racing. And drinking. Oh no, that had been going on for some time. <laughs> a little bit away from sailing, you mentioned the Air Force in Canada. Just tell us a bit about that history there. Uh, it's a long and boring story, so I won't. No, no, it's, I think I won't interesting. fill you, fill you in totally. But basically, I was a failed Australian uni student on my way around the world, which there were plenty of in those days. I can assure you. I think if you dropped out of uni, the first thing you did was get on a boat for London, and uh, of course, I did what everyone did. I was no, no, uh, not one to not follow the, the crowd. Anyway, I was on my way back, and I was in Canada, and uh, it was the summer of. 57 I think it was and uh, no one could get work there and we were going broke and my two travelling mates and I said oh well we'd better swallow our pride and telegraph home for money and uh, they got telegrams back saying yes go to the Royal Bank of Canada at such and such present your passport you get your money and my telegram said you got yourself into this now get yourself out signed dad and we were discussing that uh, at a party one night and somebody said, I've got a great idea, what you do is you join the Air Force. I said, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> no, no, listen, you join the Air Force and the first thing that happens is if you get selected for flying, you go to the officer cadet school and you spend four months there and you're being paid $60 a week fully found and if you can't save your fare out of that, you're not trying. Yeah, but I'd be in the Air Force. Yes, but if you fail the exams in the last month, they kick you out. Oh. Okay, good idea. The only problem with that was that the last month they gave you a flying training, uh, 10 hours in a chipmunk, which uh, uh, I thought, God, where'd they keep these sports cars all my life? And next thing I knew I was in the Air Force to stay. Right. And I spent the next six and a half years there. In the Canadian Air Force? Canadian Air Force, yeah. Right. Mm.
So that's where you learnt your flying skills. That's where I learned to fly, yeah. yeah. Which we'll get to in a moment as well. <laughs> so anyway, we'll get back to sailing the CYC. So you mentioned Corroboree. Yep. Um, did you do a Hobart with, on Corroboree? No, John Wilde didn't do Hobarts. Right. Uh, at least not while I was sailing yeah. with him. Uh, I don't think, I'm not sure he ever had. But uh, in 71, well, in 70, I sailed with John um, Keelty on Tirana, uh, which was an ideal boat to do a big Hobart in. And if you recall, 1970 was one of those gale last years, and it was, you know, terrifying for me. My first, first long ocean race. Um, but Chirana finished. Chirana yeah. finished. Yeah, we finished. Did well actually, uh, for you know, for an old boat. Yeah. Um, and memory is a strange thing, you know. I did another 14 altogether. <laughs> you know, you'd have thought some you'll remember, it, others you won't. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But I think it would be fair to say that uh, once you got involved here at the CYC, you embraced the club and club life because um, it wasn't too long after, I think, that you probably joined the publications committee. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And became 70, a, 73 or 74 or 5, something like that. And began, became a big contributor to mm. the offshore magazine. Mm. You wrote a column, column, Biggles column, wasn't it? Biggles column, yeah. The Biggles obviously came from the Air Force connection, yeah. yeah. Well, that, that, I got that nickname on Pasha. Uh, everyone on Pasha called me Biggles, and uh, I sailed on Pasha for three years, and the name stuck, and then everyone was calling me Biggles. Not Mr. Biggles? Not Mr. Biggles, no, just hey you, Biggles. <laughs> <laughs> but just let's go back to the publication committee. I mean, that, the Offshore, I think, was a monthly publication then, or was it to every... Uh, I can't recall. I think it. I think it was every two months. Yeah, but it was a real in-house magazine, oh, wasn't yeah. it? I mean, yeah, it was all so. about club life and the characters. Yeah. And you yeah. had a, a column that mm. you sort of wrote more of the, the sport in general, didn't you? Yeah. you? yeah, yeah, yeah. And was that something you researched a lot? I might order just. No, it was. It was David Colfelt's idea, the editor. Um, he came up with the idea and said, "Why don't you write a column that?" sort of just an ocean racing column, mm. uh, which no one has done. And uh, it wasn't, there wasn't even one in the newsstand magazines. So I didn't have anything to guide me, I just went into it. And uh, sometimes they were serious columns and sometimes they were whimsical. <laughs> uh, usually they were whimsical when I couldn't find anything to write about, so I'd make something up. <laughs> but it did, it did get publicity, your column, around the world at times, because you wrote on safety and various issues yeah. that were really relevant to the ocean racing sport. Mm. Well, I mean, the ROIC, I remember, picked it up occasionally and yeah. quoted you and things like that. So yeah. that must have been a, a big uh, thrill for you to know that you're going worldwide as a, a quoted. Well, well, I always assumed I only had two readers. One was my mother and, uh, and uh, the other one was um, uh, Kilo, um, Jim Kilroy. Jim Kilroy used to write to me and say, you yeah. <laughs> know. Uh, so I figured I had two readers, yeah. Jim and my mother. But that, uh, talk about characters, I mean, Tony Cable comes across every conversation as a, as a character. Oh, definitely. I mean, the, the, the publication meetings, which he, he was chairman, I think, of the Publications Committee for a long while. They were a riot. They must have been a riot. They you know? were an absolute riot from beginning to end. Yeah. yeah. It must have been a great despair for David Colfelt, who was the editor for most of my time. <laughs> he had this rabble that he, that he called his writing stuff. But it was a great little publication, wasn't it? I mean, it was really... Well, it, yeah, I think it was, it, it sort of ticked the boxes in the, in the sense that it, it, it wrote without fear or favour. It wasn't, it didn't have any, it didn't have to pay allegiance to advertisers. It didn't have to pay allegiance to anyone, really, uh, except I think the Commodores used to get a bit despairing of what went on. But uh, basically, you could write what you liked, and, and up to a point, of course short of um, uh, libelous yeah. uh, actions. Um, and, uh, and of course, everyone on the committee were ocean racers. Uh, we weren't journalists, I mean, we were in, uh, you know, in a sense, but basically we were all ocean racers. So we wrote about ocean racing and, and the things that happened, the funny things that happened, the serious, we discussed, as I said, sometimes my columns were funny, sometimes they were discussing something serious. Uh, so they were being aired by people who knew what they were talking about. And, and we're in the sport. So if you like, it was being written by the first 15. And um, that, that, I think, added some sort of uh, gravitas to it in some ways. And, uh, and certainly it, it was authentic, if nothing else. <laughs> yeah. no, it was a, 
the publication, I think everyone looked forward to really getting it and getting their teeth into it. But, um, so then you continued on with your sailing here. Um, what other boats um, in the early days did you sail? Because you had your own Dunkinson, 35, yeah, that, didn't you? The yeah, that, that came yeah. later. That, yeah. um, I spent three years on Pasha. Um, Tell us about that, Sir Robert Crichton Brown, and some of those characters. Well, John Wilde and Corroboree got married, and that was the end of his ocean racing. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a lot of quite a few people. Yes. Uh, and uh, we were looking for uh, John Dawson and myself were on Corroboree, and we were both looking for rides in the 72, in 72, and um, as it happened, a uh, 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 Pasha was just looking for crew too, and we just fell into it, basically, which was a big step up for me because, you know, I really wasn't terribly experienced at that stage, and to step onto a, a frontline boat like Pasha in, in the early 70s was a big move up for me. Did you step on as navigator? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, because Stan Darling had got crook, yeah. and um, but uh, basically learning the, the sport from people like Peter Green and uh, uh, Bill Bold and guys like that was a real you know, step up for me in a huge way. And three years with them I sort of learned the sport. Um, learned how to drink with John Dawson. Uh, no, I'd already done that. Yeah, I'd already done that. I did that in the Air Force actually. Yeah, <laughs> um, and, uh, and then I went from Pasha to, um, uh, I did Built my own boat. A syndicate group of us, three or four of us, built our own boat and went racing, and that was fairly successful. That was quadrille. Uh, that was the first quadrille. Duncanson. That was a three-quarter tonner. Yeah. Duncanson, the yeah. Duncanson boat, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. Raced in your meter or Subaru in that? Didn't no, you? no, that was the next boat. Right. Okay. Uh, but we won the point score in the three-quarter tonner, and uh, and then sold the, the syndicate broke up fairly quickly, and we sold out and. Uh, I got the next quadrille, which was another Duncanson 36 or 7, I think they called 37, I think they called it. And that's when I won the Namir race, or the division of the Namir race. And that. Just go back to Pasha and Sir Robert Crichton Brown. I mean, he was a colourful character in many senses. What was it like sailing with, uh, with Sir Robert? He, he was a leader. I mean, there was never any doubt about who was in control, even though you knew you had the best sailing master in the fleet, in Peter Green running it. I mean, you knew who was in command. It was it was Robert Crichton Brown, and uh, uh, you know a lot of people didn't like him, but I admire that leadership capability that he had, and uh, there was never any doubt in anyone's mind who was running the show. Um, and I, I, being military trained, I sort of responded to that. And, and Peter Green was also a good leader. I'm, I'm sort of downgrading his position, really, but because I shouldn't, because he was definitely the sailing master, called the shots. Um, but as a relatively inexperienced guy, particularly navigation, uh, I'd only sort of fall into that because I was professional. Somebody said, the navigator didn't show up one day and somebody said, well look, you're a pilot, you must be able to navigate. What? <laughs> and I'd never navigated at sea. Uh, so I went from there. And, um, but you gained a fair reputation after that as a navigator in demand? Yeah, I, I tend to think that was a bit of guardian angel luck. That, that sort of gave me that position, much undeserved position as a crack navigator, and that was the 73, I think, Hobart on Pasha, and um, you'll remember it, there was a lot of fog down the Tassie coast, and we hadn't had a star sight or a sun sight for days, and we left, gave it on, was, uh, light was the last sight we'd had, and no one had had a sight, and we were heading down the coast, and, and it was fog shrouded, and you couldn't get a fix, visual fix or anything, and the whole Southern Cross Cup team got swept past Tasman Island right down to uh, Bruny Island because no one could knew what was going on. And I just never guessed the set. I was sort of looking around me for about 12 hours and thought, well, there's got to be set here. And, and I must have picked it spot on. It was sheer, can I say ass? Am I allowed <laughs> to say it? it was sheer ass. And we turned into Storm Bay in the fog. And when the fog lifted, we were about a mile south of the rail. And uh, of course, Greeny told anyone who'd listened then about all this, and 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 uh, Ted uh, Ted Kaufman was furious because he was on one of the boats that had gone by. And well, he only went to Antarctica. Ted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he came up to me in the in the uh, in the customs house hotel, and he was furious. He said, "How did you get? How did you get that set? How did you?" He was absolutely beside himself. And I said, "Well, it had to be there, Ted. You know, 
being yeah. a smart aleck. Yeah. So that, there, Ted, didn't you know that? You know, sort of thing. It just made him worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that, that was the start of my so-called reputation, which probably didn't last too long. Right. <laughs> but uh, with, as I said, you were involved with the Publications Committee, but mm. also you then became involved in more committees and then finally you became a Vice Commodore for a couple of years here yep. and yep. then Commodore for two mm. years. Yep. Tell us a bit about that leading this club and... Uh... Uh, well, it, it, it was a bit like leading an unruly rugby club, I should think, a bit like the Waratahs or <laughs> something like that. Um, or at the moment the wall Wallabies. Uh, it. it it was a challenging position, as it turned out. I didn't think it was going to be that way, but uh, I had—I started off with a very good CEO who, who deserted me, as you would remember, because mm, it was yeah. you. <laughs> yes. Uh, deserted me about three months into it, and as luck would have it, I kept being handed CEOs by various board members. And said, "Well, this guy's good. You better have him," and we'd try him, and, uh, and they were hopeless. And this went on for two years almost. And um, but it was, if I could interrupt, mm. it was a, a stage of redevelopment of the club, was a building redevelopment. Yeah. I mean, there was a yeah. lot happening, and I mean, there was a lot there of was, in the air. Wasn't yeah, there, there was a lot happening. Uh, most of the work, as far as the redevelopment concerned, had been done by George Gervis. Mm. You know, you've got to give him credit for that. I came on board in '84, and we opened it in '84, mid mid '84. So most of the work had been done. What hadn't been done was paying for it, and. Uh, our treasurer suddenly discovered a 250,000 hole in the, in the accounts that he hadn't bargained for a payment and I had to go cap in hand to the NAB and borrow a quarter of a million dollars. And I didn't have much experience with that sort of thing, being a tech, techo, technical person. And, uh, and I got into the boardroom at NAB and there were all these heavy stats sitting around and all they wanted to talk about was sailing. And I, in, the, in the desperation I said, well, you know, can we have we're going to get the loan. They said, of course you're going to get the loan. Now, what about this race? <laughs> How easy is this? How <laughs> easy is this, yeah. yeah. But I, I think um, also, I mean, you were very instrumental in, in getting a lot of the social activities going for the club, which were money raising at the time. I mean, like the sportsman's lunch we used to run yeah. every month. I mean, you, yeah. you instigated all that. Yeah, I did you know, that when I was vice Yeah, and they were terrific. I mean, we had a lot of guest speakers, not necessarily yachtsmen, but we had you know, Olympic people, Olympians here, and mm. they were terrific times, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, they were, they were great. Yeah. And they were sellouts every, every month. Yeah. yeah, of course, that was in the days before the, what was it, the fringe benefits tax. Yes. And, uh, you know, a lot of the city people, the stockbrokers and lawyers and what have you, would take long lunches, and uh, this fitted right into their, their program, if you like. Uh, and they'd all get into taxis and come out here and have a long lunch and get poured into taxis for the trip back into town and they all loved it. Yeah. So we had, a, yeah, we had a dining room full every time. But intertwined in all of this, it was your, your, your real job, which was a, a yeah. pilot, a jumbo pilot. Well, that was difficult, difficult in the Commodore years, not so bad in the, in the Vice Commodore years because in the uh, uh, Vice Commodore years, the, the aviation Industry was in a downturn, and by, but by the time I got to be Commodore, it was in the upturn, which meant more work for us and me. And, and so I was flying quite a lot, and then coming home, spending a lot of time in the office without without club managers. Mm. And uh, I wasn't any good at that, I can assure you. I was not a good club manager. But what we did have was a really good staff in those days who really took care of everything. I and mean, basically, all I did was come in and take an overview and walk out again. You sign the checks. And, yeah. yeah. So you were flying with Qantas then, weren't you? With yeah. Qantas, yeah. 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 How many years do you have with, with Qantas? 25. Yeah. Times have changed. I remember I was going to America once and uh, you happened to be the pilot and you said on approach to Hawaii, oh, i just come up in the cockpit and sit here and put the headphones on and you'll see how we do it. Imagine doing that today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah you get shot. Yeah. You lose yeah. your licence. Yes, indeed. Mm. But did you go then to Singapore after? Yeah, I took early retirement from yeah. Qantas. Uh, it was after I'd been Commodore uh, uh, about two years, 88, so it was two years nearly two years after I uh, stood down as Commodore and um, uh, the, it, oh, I won't go into details of that but um, basically it was just a better deal and I went there for uh, eight years as it turned out. I went up there on a two-year contract that turned into eight years. Mm. 